Good morning, this is Jeff Riddle uh, with Purdue Specialty Crops. I'm the Grower Relations Manager and here today to share more information about one of our specialty crops, high uric acid rapeseed. You'll hear us uh, use the name here, which is an acronym standing for high uric acid rapeseed. I uh, wanted to share a little information about, about the crop and our program uh, today. So starting off, what is rapeseed? So it's a winter crop. It's a member of the brassica family. Um, brassicas indicate that they're cold hardy crops. This crop's typically grown in your rotation in place of winter wheat. Uh, and it's grown as an oil seed crop, which in this particular one has about 40% oil, which is one of the higher percent oils for any oil seed crop. It's in the same family as cabbage, mustard, turnip, Brussels sprouts. All those are uh, brassicas that are characterized by a blue-green leaf. Uh, they uh, get a wax coating on the leaf, and that's what makes them uh, cold hardy. You're probably more familiar with uh, another variety of rapeseed that is called canola. Uh, canola is a variety of rapeseed that's been bred to have a lower content of one of the fatty acids, the uric acid that we're talking about, whereas the crop we grow is high uric acid rapeseed. Uh, it, our crop is used more for industrial applications. Canola is used for more for food applications. The two uh, are identical crops. Um, if, if you had them in the field, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. Um, the agronomics for raising them is identical, but because of that uh, uric acid content, uh, you must keep the two separate through the entire process should you grow both of them. You have to keep them uh, segregated all the way through or else you wouldn't be able to use them if, if they were co-mingled for either. Uh, either as canola or as high uric acid rapeseed. So the crop itself has some unique properties that uh, uh, make it useful in the plastics industry as uh, slip agent and friction reducers. It's also used in lubricating oils and cosmetics, uh, personal care items, and in small amounts in some food applications. So some of the benefits of growing uh, rapeseed is it extends your rotations. It's giving you another uh, cropping option, and this helps in breaking the weed and pest cycles. Another benefit is it has a nice taproot, which makes it drought tolerant, but also that uh, taproot helps break up your uh, soil compaction and improves your soil tilth. Now this crop takes more nitrogen than um, winter wheat, the crop we're replacing in your rotation, but it's also leaving more behind. And typically the crops that follow rapeseed see a yield bump of anywhere two to four bushels. Another benefit that we've heard from growers where you typically try and plant beans behind winter wheat and you can be susceptible to some hair pinning and uh, the residue for rapeseed is a much lighter residue and it's easier to plant back. So rapeseed itself or here is not a hard crop to grow. Um, it's, uh, you know, if you can get it planted well, uh, it's pretty much downhill from there. So there's sort of three key events in growing the crop. First and foremost, uh, it is a small seeded crop, so you need to take your time in planting this crop. Uh, do a good job, dial in either your planter or your drill. Uh, you only plant it about a quarter to a half inch deep, um, and you wanna really focus on doing a good job planting it. If you get a good consistent stand and a clean field, the rest of the year is downhill. The second key step is applying your spring fertilization at the right time. Typically, you put your full P and K requirements down at planting and a third of your nitrogen and sulfur 
and then in spring you put out the remaining two-thirds of the nitrogen and two-thirds of the sulfur um, and this helps fuel the aggressive plant growth as this crop breaks dormancy and grows from a rosette of about six to 18 inches tall uh, up to a four to six foot plant. And then the third uh, key event is getting your harvest timing right. Uh, being a small seeded crop, when you store this grain, it's hard to drive air through it. So it's important to harvest at around 9% moisture on this crop, harvest and deliver at that point. So those are the three key events in growing the crop show you pictorially uh, sort of the growth stages of the crop. <clears throat> the crop, as I mentioned, is, uh, goes in your rotation in place of winter wheat. Uh, although you're planting a little bit earlier than wheat, ideally uh, it's great if you can get planted in September up to as late as maybe the first, second week of October. But ideally, if you can get it in ground, uh, at least here in the mid-Atlantic about uh, sometime in September that allows it to get to a rosette of six to eight true leaves before it goes into dormancy. So as the crop emerges, once you plant it, you can see it start to emerge in as little as three to five days. It's, it's characteristic of the butterfly cotyledon leaves. Um, and here is sort of a shot of uh, the rosette, you like to get it, as I said, to six to eight true leaves before it goes into dormancy. Once it goes into dormancy over the winter, one of the characteristics of brassicas, you may see some purpling of the leaves. Uh, you can sort of see some of that here. Uh, and then some of the leaves will senesce off or die off during the winter. Um, when the crop goes into dormancy in the winter, it doesn't look too good. The, the rosettes, you get that purpling, some dead leaf material, and they'll sort of droop some. And that's just telling you that the crop's going into dormancy. Um, as you get into uh, February, where the days get longer and uh, temperatures start to warm, the reverse happens. The rosettes perk up. You get sort of that deep blue-green in the leaves. Um, then come sometime in early March, you'll start to see these little flower buds form down in the crowns of the, uh, of the rosette. And this is, is sort of signaling you that stem extension will be coming shortly thereafter. And it's important as you get to this stage to get the rest of that spring fertilization out at this point or slightly before. Then as stem extension starts, you see the flower bud and the primary stem extend up out of the center of the crown and then auxiliary stems will start forming and then the crop will begin to go into flower. Very pretty crop when it's in flower. This usually occurs in um, uh, late March through April. Uh, pollinators come out of nowhere to find, find uh, or excuse me, come out of everywhere to find this crop because it's one of the few crops in full flower at that time of year. Uh, as you start to finish up flowering, you go into pod set. These long, thin pods uh, form on the crop. Um, and, and then you go into seed set within the pods. And then sometime in later May, you'll start to see the crop begin to dry down. Uh, at this point, you're wanting to uh, begin to check the seed color change and the moisture in the crop. And then the crop harvest uh, uh, sometime in uh, early to mid-June, uh, depending on whether you go natural dry down or you use a desiccant to bring it out. Um, if you're looking at planting this crop, <clears throat> You know, obviously you want to test your soil, get a, uh, 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 see what, you know, P and K requirements you need to add uh, for the crop. Uh, typically the uptake for a 50 bushel crop of rapeseed is about um, 150 pounds of nitrogen, uh, about 80 P and 100 to 120 K and about 30 of sulfur. So you typically put down your full P and K requirements at planting. 
um, and then a third of your nitrogen and sulfur, and then the remaining two thirds of nitrogen and sulfur go out in uh, uh, late February, early March. Um, you want to prep your fields. You can plant this as uh, uh, men till, conventional till, or no till. Um, the big thing is trying to get good seed to soil contact. Um, that seems a prepared seed bed, bed seems to work a little bit better than a no-till situation, but you can do either. And then uh, it's important to make sure you don't plant the crop too deep. Uh, we wanted uh, somewhere from a quarter to a half inch. If you if moisture there's not a lot of moisture at planting, you can go as deep as three quarters, but never deeper than an inch. Um, and ideally, de depending on your row width, um, we want to plant uh, roughly around seven to eight plants per square foot to end up with no less than five per square foot. Uh, optimal row spacing for this crop is typically a, a seven and a half to a 15 inch row. We do have people that plant as wider. Uh, as wide as 30 inch rows. Uh, on the wider rows, uh, you might see a little yield drag just because it's harder to uh, get the number of uh, um, overall plant population that you need. Um, this crop works best on fills that are well drained. Because it has that big tap root, you don't want to put it on a field that might hold standing water for long periods of time. That can stunt or kill the plant if it stands in water too long. You can plant this either with a planter using uh, many of the, the manufacturers have canola or rapeseed plates. If not, you can also use a small sorghum plate, uh, emphasis being on the small sorghum uh, seed size plate or small sugar beet plate. Uh, many guys use drills as well. If you use a drill, it seems to work best with a small seed box or grass seed attachment. Uh, crop doesn't have too many diseases that you have to worry about, but the primary ones that you want to keep an eye out is uh, uh, sclerotinia or white mold. Uh, typically, uh, you see this if we have real wet conditions uh, and warm temperatures. Another one to uh, keep an eye out is for alternary or black spot. Uh, there are fungicides to treat uh, for both of these, so no problem to manage them. And then there are a few pests uh, that we run into. Primarily one is, is uh, uh, the cabbage seed pod weevil uh, and, uh, or uh, green peach aphid, and those are two that you want to keep an eye out for in a, a fungi or insecticide treatment can handle either one of those. This is a listing of uh, labeled chemicals for use with rapeseed, so several tools that you have available to you. So Purdue, uh, this is some of the ways that we work with our growers. Um, this is a bid price contract, so the pricing can change upon market conditions, but once you lock in, that is a fixed price, and that, that you'll be paid at that price uh, for all your deliveries. Uh, these are acre contracts, and they have full act of God coverage, so if anything happens, if a hailstorm or flood and you lose some of your crop, you just let us know and we reduce uh, your con contracted acres and production accordingly. All our contracts are full production purchase guarantees. So you don't have to worry about will it be a home for what you grow. Um, we Purdue does no speculation. We don't offer contracts to our growers until we have um, in place um, contracts with our end use uh, customers. So that way you can always rest assured that there's a home for what you're growing. Um, there is crop insurance available on this crop. Uh, you can contact your local agent to get the details for what they provide for your specific area. And then throughout the year, uh, we're here to support our growers. We look at it as if you don't succeed, neither do we. So we want to do everything we can to help you be successful. 
before each key period during the year uh, or along the year or along the way. Uh, we issue agronomic updates telling you about this event's coming up. Here's the important things you need to do and why. Um, also during the year while we're out looking at crops, if we come across any problems, either a pest or disease, we'll issue a crop alert saying we found this in this area and we tell you what it looks like and what the treatment plan would be just to give you an alert that, hey, you want, may want to keep an eye out for this. We're seeing it in the, this area. So <clears throat> we continue to uh, uh, try and price our program to where it makes you a little bit more than winter wheat. We've added additional delivery locations. Uh, we've tried to improve the dump times at uh, our different elevators so that it goes as smooth as possible. Uh, we've added for um, uh, a cost share program uh, we found that utilizing cross augers on these hitters make uh, the harvest of the crop go much smoother. So we've uh, come up with a cost share program where uh, Purdue helps share the cost over three years um, with our growers, provided they agree to grow the crop for three years. So some nice features we have. We continue to look for varieties that yield better. And then we uh, also are going to be doing grower field days for information sharing as well. So you buy your planting seed um, through Purdue. This ensures that we have the heuristic levels that our in use customers uh, require. Uh, you'll see that uh, these are the current varieties that we have available. Our seeds uh, packaged in 35 pound bags that typically plant, plant excuse me, plants 11 to 12 acres, and seed cost, depending on the row width uh, that you're planting on, can run you 65 to $71 an acre. We have uh, early contract and premiums where we give you a reduction on that uh, seed cost as well. And then here's some history of uh, some of our yields from different trials we've done. Uh, I've highlighted the ones in Kentucky and Tennessee, and then we have uh, trial results for other areas as well. Um, this is some of the characteristics of the varieties we use uh, that may help you in choosing what variety works best for your area. And then here's contact information for um, some of your Purdue representatives, myself, uh, and then uh, Aaron Riddle, uh, as well as Jeff Rice, who's sort of our feet on the ground out in the Kentucky, Tennessee area. And then there's other representatives across the Mid-Atlantic. But we'd be happy to work with you or answer additional questions on this crop. So please feel free to give us a call. Thank you for your time and participating today.